Tommy will give us a sign. Okay, now we're on. Okay, I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Went to Woodlawn High School. Uh, the war, uh, Second World War was going on at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, I think I was about 14 when it started. And uh, it was still going on near my, in my senior year. So I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. And uh, as soon as uh, I graduated from high school, uh, I was called to, to active duty. And at that time, I think the Marines were on Okinawa at that time, and that was the last uh, island before the home islands of Japan. So mm -hmm. we all knew where we were going mm -hmm. for invading Japan. I was in Paris Island boot camp uh, when they dropped the big bomb. Mm -hmm. I was within a couple of weeks of, uh, of getting out. Mm -hmm. And the drill, you know, we had no radio, we had no news except what the drill instructor told us. And he said uh, they dropped a bomb that blew the whole city up and we didn't know what he was talking about. But anyhow, <clears throat> our plan, uh, all, all of us were going to be riflemen. And uh, <clears throat> the plan was when we got out of boot camp and get to Paris Island that we'd go to Camp Lejeune mm -hmm. for advanced uh, rifleman training. Mm -hmm. But when the war was over, uh, we didn't go to Camp Lejeune. We, uh, uh, they, uh, the drill instructor read off, you know, where we're going, and 99% of the people were going to California, Camp Pendleton, and uh, and I got word to report to the drill instructor, and I knocked on the door and I said, Private Hobson reporting is directed his order, sir. Mm -hmm. He said, are you one of those aviators? And I said, no, sir, I'm not an aviator. He said, well, you're going to be one. You're going to Cherry Point, North Carolina. So, you know, that's where the Marine Air Wing was. So I, I was broken hearted. All my friends were going to Camp Pendleton. Mm -hmm. California was like another country, you know, as far as I'm concerned. So anyhow, I, um, uh, it, it Right away, I went and told them that I'd like to be transferred to uh, to, to Camp Pendleton. And they said, "Well, we've got a group going out there in in, a, in about a month or six weeks, and uh, uh, but you know we'll just have to give you some kind of temporary assignment." So I got the assignment of of cleaning the the uh, let's say the men's room. <laughs> that was my job. And Been so, there, done that. Yeah, and. Uh, I had a, I had some sulfuric acid, and a and a brush. Brushes didn't last very long, mm -hmm. but uh, <clears throat> that's what I cleaned those things with. And uh, we had an inspection one time. The captain and the, and the, and the first sergeant came in, and and I was standing at attention, and they. Uh, uh, it, it did look good, I'll have to admit. Uh, <laughs> you could see yourself in the bowls, you know. And uh, the uh, the captain said, "Jay, give this man a 71." And uh, in in the uh, 72 hour pass course, you know, it's three days. And uh, if you get 72, uh, they charge you three days of uh, of leave. Mm -hmm. If you get a 71, they don't. It don't show up on your leave, so it's kind of a freebie. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, that's uh, probably enough about that. And then when I got out of uh, the Marine Corps, uh, I enrolled at the University of Alabama mm -hmm. in the School of right. Engineering, and it was uh, uh, very crowded. What year was that? That was 1950. Okay. Is that right? No. That was I got out in '50. It was '46. Okay. Yeah. You know, anyhow, uh, I took uh, mechanical engineering and uh, <clears throat> was not a uh, uh, outstanding student, just an average student. And uh, anyhow, when I got out, uh, oh, I remember, <clears throat> uh, I didn't have much money back then. They had the GI Bill. And they gave you a slide rule, and they gave you a drawing, mm -hmm. and they pay. I think you got fifty dollars a month or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And uh, anyhow, you didn't have a whole lot of money. So uh, they had ROTC down there. And the, uh, the, if the person had never been in the military, he started off in, in you know, the, at the bottom, in the ROTC, learning how to march and do the rifle and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> but I'd been in the service. So I went into advanced ROTC, and they, uh, uh, you, you got 90 cents a day for being in advanced ROTC, and you got that even Saturdays and Sundays when you weren't at school. So that would buy a good breakfast, you know. So, and I, <clears throat> I looked at the history books, and they never had been two wars very close together, you know, more than about 20 or 25 years. So. While I was there, the Korean War broke out, and so uh, I got commissioned second lieutenant mm -hmm. in the uh, Corps of Engineers, and uh, I got sent to Camp Rucker and uh, as second lieutenant down there for a while, and then got uh, sent over to Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, so I spent spent about a year over in Korea. That was an interesting place, mm -hmm. uh, and then. Uh, uh, over there, they let you go on rest and recuperation leave every once in a while. I'd been once, and I was I was on uh, my second R and R, we called it. That's right. And uh, and and they called for me over the loudspeaker and said, and said uh, "You need to go back to your camp." Said uh, you're going on Big R. Yeah, that uh, Big R was was uh, was. Uh, 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 was uh, getting out of the army, you know, mm -hmm. being uh, released from mm -hmm. the army. So, so then uh, I uh, I'd had my BS at uh, Alabama, and then I got more GI Bill for being in a couple more years uh, uh, during the Korean War. So I, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, so I went back to school. And got my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, back then, uh, the aerospace companies were actively recruiting mm -hmm. uh, engineers, and I got offers from, I think, five different uh, Boeing in Wichita, Northrop Patton, uh, California. Uh, uh, but anyhow, the one that I accepted was uh, General Dynamics in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And they gave me my choice. I could either work in propulsion or in structures and uh, back then if you worked in structures you had a big drawing board and, mm -hmm. and uh, so I picked propulsion mm -hmm. and uh, so I worked there at General Dynamics for nine and a half years. Well that's and, where I met you. Yeah that's, that's right. where right. that's where we met. Right. And uh, We were in a carpool together. Yeah we right. were, sure were. Right. Uh, and uh, that that uh, experience of General Dynamics was very uh, valuable to me later on because we worked on a lot of Air Force stuff and we, we worked on a lot of advanced things that, that I haven't really uh, worked on at, at Marshall, at NASA, but have come in very handy. Like we at that time, the Air Force was interested in nuclear airplanes mm -hmm. and also nuclear rockets. And so uh, we, I worked on the ANP program, Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion yeah. Program, for a good while. And it turned out that uh, one, one fellow said, you know, nuclear, nuclear power plants are inherently uh, stationary. And I think he was probably <laughs> right because it, it, it was heavy. And, uh, and there was a real narrow corridor that you had to fly out of the United States on uh, that was not heavily populated in mm -hmm. case the plane crashed. So anyhow, they, they, uh, that program ended, but we did a lot of nuclear testing on mm -hmm. materials. I don't remember Teflon, that's the worst material. It just comes apart under nuclear radiation and some, usually metals are, are okay, but a lot of the, uh, polymers, you mm -hmm. know, they break the bonds mm -hmm. and, Right. They come apart, but anyhow, I was involved in a lot of the testing on nuclear stuff. We did a little work on uh, electric propulsion, ion propulsion. Uh, we 
worked on uh, uh, what they call high energy propellants, like uh, for at that time I think they're using about jet, jet propulsion or jet fluid. It's kerosene, you know, it's a high Great grade of kerosene. Yeah. yeah. Well, about seven <coughs> now, but it, back then there's JP4 mm -hmm. we're using. And so they were looking at uh, some uh, propellant that would b give you more energy per cubic foot or per pound. And I, I think remember, one of them was the JP6. Well, yeah, well, the one I remember mainly is uh, ethyl decaboride. Yeah. And it was a boron type. Uh, problem is it it plated a glass like material out in the in the afterburner area and uh, anyhow that turned out not to be good but it, it was kind of fun to work on worked on some classified stuff uh, anyhow uh, it, general dynamics was a was a really uh, really a good technical company the ones two sharp on management because we didn't win too many contracts but we had the B-58 contract which uh, I think we built about 117 B-58s when the B-58 was first uh, conceived at that time we had bases all around Russia and uh, they wanted an airplane that was very fast uh, could fly on the deck and uh, the range didn't have to be that great. Mm -hmm. And so B-58 was a Mach 2, which most fighters weren't Mach 2 at that time. Mm -hmm. It was a Mach 2 uh, Delta Wing uh, bomber. And that's when um, we got kicked out of the, you know, I think, uh, I, I remember the main one, we got the, uh, the uh, Turks uh, wouldn't let us fly out of Turkey anymore. Mm -hmm. So it ended up that all those close in bases that we had kind of disappeared and the B-58 didn't have the range mm -hmm. uh, now mm -hmm. it had it's uh, it didn't have a bomb bay the uh, like the, the what it carried was external mm -hmm. right and uh, one of the things was a, a nuclear bomb that you you know you drop and mm -hmm. try to get away before it explodes and, and uh, another one was what they called a uh, it was actually a, a, a air to surface missile, mm -hmm. and it had a it auxiliary power unit to you know to work the controls and all that kind of stuff, and uh, it used a, it used a, as an oxidizer for the rocket engine. It used red fuming nitric acid, mm -hmm. and the uh, and JP four was a fuel, and uh, uh, it turned out later. That program got canceled. Turned out later that uh, when we got into the race with the Russians, uh, that turned out to be the Gina engine, which was the only space engine that we had. It came from the B-58 program, and uh, and and then we uh, we bid on the, uh, the there was a competition there called a TFX. Mm -hmm. It was a <clears throat> McNamara was the uh, Secretary of Defense, I believe it was at that time, and uh, he wanted an airplane that would be good for all services that could land on a carrier or, or that sort of thing. Well, uh, we, there was about, about six companies that bid on that, including us. Uh, we got, uh, they, they down-selected the two companies. Uh, Boeing and uh, General Dynamics. And uh, one thing that impressed me, uh, the uh, McDonald wasn't one of the winners. Mm -hmm. So the day after the, uh, the down select, a contingent of high level McDonald uh, people came to General Dynamics and said, you know, we'll make all our We'll, we'll, we'll send a hundred engineers down here. We'll make all our wind tunnel data available to you. Uh, we think we can show you how to cut a couple of drag counts off your, off your configuration, but we want to escape capsule. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they, I don't know, they probably put you in jail for that now, but, uh, there was a handshake. That was a billion dollar program, the mm -hmm. escape capsule. 
And uh, so, sure enough, they did send those engineers down there. And uh, we were, am I, am, am I getting too far? No, no, uh, you, uh, you, you, uh, there. You may remember also on the B-58, uh, they finally had to go to an escape capsule, you know, uh, from that plane. Yeah. Too. I think that was the progenitor uh, for the. It, uh, it probably PFA. was. Yeah. And uh, you, you had le you left uh, uh, Fort Worth uh, somewhere around that time to come to Huntsville, I think. Yeah, the TFX they called it mm -hmm. uh, was uh, was in the competition when I left. It was awarded to General Dynamics mm -hmm. after I had already left. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, they they. They had two engines that were uh, that you could pick one or the other. The Air Force did. One of them was Pratt and Whitney, and the other one was General Electric. And the one good decision General Dynamics man management made was picking the Pratt and Whitney engine. Mm -hmm. Pratt and Whitney at that time was known for really reliable. Whatever they said they could do, they could do mm -hmm. more than right. that. And uh, the GE engine was shorter. It was uh, it was lighter, and uh, uh, Boeing uh, went with that, mm -hmm. and we went with a with a Pratt and Whitney longer, heavier engine, and uh, then uh, the Air Force down selected engines, and they selected the Pratt and Whitney. Well, there was Boeing with the, their design based on the GE, so in order to keep the center gra uh, center of gravity in the right place and all that, they had to tilt the, the, the engine. It was two engines. They had mm -hmm. to tilt them because they, they, were, they were too long mm -hmm. for, for their that kind of shoulder inlets and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, the engine was called a TF-30, and some of the WAGs called their engine a TF Cosin 30 because it was like that. <laughs> and anyhow, General Dynamics ended up winning that. And that's about the time that I, I came to Huntsville. Yeah. Now, I've been to Huntsville once before. I've been up to Wright Patterson a lot. Uh, we did the uh, the structural testing with heat lamps and everything else with B 58 up there. And uh, that, um, when you go to Wright Patterson uh, and you go to the different uh, I guess discipline areas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like they didn't speak, talk to each other. You know, one of them didn't know what the other one was doing, mm -hmm. and it seemed like a pretty relaxed atmosphere up there to me. And then uh, I got called on at the last minute to take uh, Bob Oliver's place, who's my boss, was coming to Huntsville to make a play, uh, make a pitch for the instrument unit structure mm -hmm. and if you remember the B-58 was practically all honeycomb. Mm -hmm. It was stainless steel, it was phenolic, it was aluminum, honeycomb everywhere so mm -hmm. we were proposing to make uh, the instrument unit out of the honeycomb structure mm -hmm. and so they gave me the job of coming up here and uh, giving a presentation on heat transfer through honeycomb structures mm -hmm. which I did but in the process you know, I got. We went to several different labs, and we went to the engineering lab, the manufacturing lab, the structures lab, and I was very impressed that everybody seemed to be on the same page as far they knew what the Saturn program was. They knew they knew what we we're going to do. Everybody was very much engaged in their work, and to me, there was all the difference in the world between. Uh, the the NASA operation that I saw in, in the Air Force operation, mm -hmm. so uh, so the the NASA Marshall people uh, they rented a hotel motel in Fort Worth and put a big spread in the paper. They were recruiting people, mm -hmm. so I went over there and I was a GS fourteen at that time, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, what do you have to do to be, you know, a GS-14, and uh, they read me off a description. I think it was on uh, uh, guidance and control of a GS-14, and you know, I said, "Well, 
Von Braun couldn't even qualify for that. You remember the way they, right. they wrote those things. So, anyhow, I turned in the application. By the way, the GS-14 was a considerable cut in pay for me. Mm -hmm. But I was from Birmingham, and uh, B-58 program was coming to an end. And so, you know, I, I decided uh, that Huntsville would be a good place to come uh, to. So, uh, so I put in the application. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then my wife and I got thinking we really like Texas, and uh, so I put in an application at Houston at JSC too. Well, I got a call from Marshall, and they offered me a job, and I accepted. Mm -hmm. The next day, I got a call from Houston. They offered me a job, and which I would really rather have taken, but I had already committed, so I told them I I couldn't accept. So. Uh, that's the way we ended up here in Huntsville. <laughs> yeah. At that time, uh, JSC was a young organization. Chris Kraft and those guys, a few of them came down from Virginia, but most of the supervisors, you know, were younger folks than the Germans that we had. And it looked like it was a better place to advance, you know. Uh, uh, but it actually, it turned out, you know, that Later on, all the Germans retired, you know, so well, turned some forcibly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, you know, uh, when after you left uh, there, I, I was still at Fort Worth. And, uh, of course, you know, uh, the, the, the real estate values were way down about that time. They were. And uh, the night when you called, uh, uh, I, I think I, I told you, you know, uh, what time tomorrow do you want to see me? <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, it took me a while to, to sell my house. And the, the day that they, they uh, said that the General Dynamics won the TFX contract, which uh, was later the F-15 or? F-111. 111, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the price of real estate jumped up. I sold my really? house that day. Is that and, right? And, and, and all of the movers. Is that right? right. Yeah, that, that was fortunate, wasn't it? Uh, actually, uh, you remember a uh, guy whose name is Dunkelberg that we were Steve Duck Steve Dunkelberg. Dunkelberg. Yeah. He bought my house the minute they announced uh, the, 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 that we had won the contract before it hit the, the paper. Because he said, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure tomorrow that house is going to be more valuable. And I said, it's still for sale for the same price. Yeah. And, and we left and uh, came and actually spent some time with you and your wife when, when we uh, got yeah. here to Huntsville there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think you you were as happy as I was to come into Huntsville. Uh, it, uh, the, 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 uh, the, let's say the, the Army and, and the Von Braun team uh, had their act together. They did. Uh, they knew exactly what they wanted to do, how to do it, and uh, it was just a matter of putting a lot of things together. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I'd done a little bit of homework before we we uh, we came to Huntsville. Uh, I had a brother who lived up in Tennessee, and during the summer, sometimes we'd go up and see him, and we'd purposely come through Huntsville. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife knew how much a box of Tide cost in Fort Worth, and mm -hmm. she'd go in the store and look around. And, and uh, the, the bottom line was that Huntsville was an extremely uh, expensive place compared to Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. uh, Fort Worth, you know, we only had 2% uh, sales tax. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what Huntsville had, but it was more. But the, the only two things that cost less than Huntsville than it did in Fort Worth were, were uh, water and, uh, and uh, electricity, mm -hmm. you know, I guess TVA. And, oh, yeah. And uh, so, and, and housing was much more expensive here. Uh, so when you look to see uh, financially what your situation is, you know, I was not only losing salary, mm -hmm. but I was losing buying power mm -hmm. too, you know, yeah. but, but it was worth it. And, uh, all the lakes and the pretty, you know, is Fort Worth on the edge of a desert. You know, there's not much out there. Well, they had at that, that time that big drought, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, there. Yeah, it had a big flood too one time. The one it broke. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyhow, uh, 
when I came here, they didn't, uh, Marshall at one time had uh, well over 8,000 people during the, uh, 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 it was a Saturn build-up. And they didn't have enough room for us on the arsenal. So we went out to this old cotton warehouse. They called it Huntsville Industrial Center. They called Hick it Center. the Hick Building, yeah. Right. And uh, I was out there, I guess, two years or something. Propulsion and structures and some other stuff was out there. Uh, that's where we, we, we both worked together there. Yeah. Uh, under Charlie Wood. Yeah, that's right. right. And uh, <clears throat> so I started off, I was, I was chief of the uh, propulsive and main jet heating unit. Mm -hmm. So my job was had to do with the uh, the exhaust heating and uh, of the of the engines. Mm -hmm. And the first job that my group I had a, a group of about eight or ten people. And uh, the first job that we got was had to do with the the big launch umbilical tower that uh, that you fired the. The, uh, the Saturn V, you know, the mm -hmm. moon part off on well, we, uh, they asked us to calculate what the pressure and temperature would be on that structure with the worst possible wind where when the, the, uh, the Saturn V started lifting off, it started mm -hmm. drifting and it would drift right over the top of that thing and fire down on top. So that was the first thing, uh, uh, that I worked on and, then later on worked on, on in the, had the thermal thermal unit uh, stress structures. Uh, I, later on was uh, my first laboratory director job was uh, systems dynamics laboratory, and then later on it was uh, systems analysis and integration mm -hmm. laboratory, and then. Uh, uh, no, I guess so. Those are two. Hey, but Bob, uh, you know, I, here, is this what we're supposed to be doing? That's exactly Just, right. Okay. Right. We're walking people through the history. Okay. Okay. Right. So, uh, I've been in a lot of jobs out there. I've been, I've been uh, chief engineer for space transportation, which is all you know, launch type vehicles. Mm -hmm. Been chief engineer for space systems, which is all the payloads and that sort of thing. Uh, didn't, uh, we, we ran into a lot of uh, unique problems. Everything was unique back then because, you know, there wasn't that much uh, history in, uh, in manned space flight. Let me take you to one particular point. Okay. That I think you were the hero of the plane. If you remember the Skylab. Uh -huh. uh, when the Skylab went up, uh, it didn't exactly get to where in the condition that we wanted it to be. And uh, you and Wayne Littles were, were two of the key people that uh, 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 saved that thing. And uh, talk to us a little about that. Okay. Uh, at that time, I was uh, head of the Environmental Control and Thermal uh, Group. In, uh, our big job was Skylab, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Patron, who was our center director then, you know, we we launched the Skylab pressurized. Mm -hmm. The uh, the atmosphere that the crew lived in was five pounds per square inch. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the partial pressure of uh, of uh, oxygen was two psi, and the partial pressure of nitrogen was three. Mm -hmm. So it was. Kind of the same percentage-wise, uh, close to it that, mm -hmm. that we're in now. But uh, anyhow, we we launched uh, with it pressurized, and uh, so when Dr. Patron said, "George, I want you to come out here the night before when they're loading the atmosphere, and uh, we will make sure we're not leaking before we launch." Mm -hmm. So I came out. I think it was 11 o'clock that night or something that they were starting that. So I came out, and really, you you couldn't really tell. Uh, you, if it was a gross leak, you could have told it. But a, a small leak would have been masked by the temperature changes, you know. So, uh, so I stayed out all night, and I thought, well, 
I'll wait a little while. You know, I want to be there when they launch it, and then I'll go home and get some sleep. And so the next uh, day, Dr. Patron called me and asked me, you know, how it was. And I said, well, as far as I can tell, it's not a leak. And uh, so then we, uh, we launched the thing, and I heard somebody say the meteoroid shield deployed. And that was before, that was when they were still on the way up. And nobody knew, you know, what, what's that about? Turned out it had been ripped off, you know. And so our thermal control, uh, a, a key part of it was the paint pattern. The, the, the part was black and part was white on the outside on the meteoroid shield. When I got ripped off, you know, a lot of our thermal control was gone. So, uh, so when the thing, thing got to orbit, uh, all our temperature measurements that we had, you know, they went off scale high. It got hot. That's right. And we didn't know what the temperature was. And so we, we knew we had a crippled spacecraft mm -hmm. up there. And, uh, and, uh, Dr. Patron, uh, all of, all of the, the big guys were at the Cape mm -hmm. to see the launch and the grunts. You know, we're in the husk, and we had all the data, and they didn't have any data, mm -hmm. so they were kind of, kind of out of it uh, there for a while. And Dr. Patron called, and he says, uh, "George, I want you to get our spaceship." He called it under thermal control. He said, "Can you, can you do it?" And I said, "Well, you know, I need a lot of help." And he said, "If there's any help you need, you don't get." He gave me his phone number at Holiday Inn down mm -hmm. there, so. So we, uh, we, we had Brown Engineering, we had, uh, we had Martin, uh, and, and we had our civil service people. So we set about to see, you know, what can we do? So we came up with, <clears throat> here it's supposed to face, supposed to face the sun all the time. Mm -hmm. Cause it was, look, it was a solar experiment. And, uh, so here it's going around, you know, it's getting full sun the whole time. So, we said, okay, we're going to pitch it over to cut down on the amount of solar, solar heating we get so we can determine what to do next. So well, it was, I think, 50 degrees that we decided on to pitch it over. So so we did, and uh, the, uh, uh, the temperatures were still high. They were still high, but we knew they were lower. And uh, we... Uh, uh, I guess some of them came back on scale. And what we did, we looked at the slope of the curve as they were going up before they went off scale. And we back calculated what they got to. And, uh, and, uh, Dr. Patron, uh, was, he said, well, how hot did we get? And I said, well, you know, best we can tell about 475 degrees on the aluminum. He asked Harold Coldwater, the structures guy, said, what's, you know, what, what's the deal on the aluminum? Are we still structurally sound? And he said, yes, sir, we're, we're structurally sound. So we don't want to send the crew up unless it was, you know, okay to do it. So the, then the next phase was determine, obviously, if we had a sun-looking experiment, we couldn't stay at 50 degrees all the time. So we had to get back to solar inertia they call it and uh so everybody in the country i think sent in a uh, 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 a uh, proposal for how to get temperature down mm -hmm. and uh other nasa centers uh, uh citizens everybody but anyhow uh, so we looked at all these and uh the uh the two that it came down to uh uh, JSC had something they call a parasol mm -hmm. to put out, and there was an, a little airlock that looked at the sun that uh, they, they were going to do an experiment from. <clears throat> they wanted to poke this <clears throat> kind of like an umbrella that was folded up out and then deployed. <clears throat> and then we had one that the marshal had one where the crew went out, and we called it a twin pole sail. Mm -hmm. And it was a pole at each Big, you know, it was a big, big piece of uh, fiberglass cloth, and 
we called it uh, the, the uh, twin pole, twin pole sail, uh, and and the decision was made to put the parasol out. Mm -hmm. Well, we put the parasol out, and it didn't deploy perfectly. It uh, it brought temperatures down, uh, but but it was still hot, still too hot. So uh, the crew. Instead of wearing their suits and stuff like that, they were in their underwear. They uh, did not sleep in the in the workshop where their quarters were. They slept up in the airlock because it was cooler mm -hmm. up there. And so, oh, one one thing that was kind of interesting, I thought, uh, <clears throat> when when we decided to pitch it over uh, 50 degrees, uh, the uh, I told the uh, the uh, attitude control people, you know, we want to we want to pitch it over 50 degrees. Well, back then we didn't have these satellites where we had continuous coverage. We had ground stations. We had we had one in Florida. We had we had one in California. We had one in Hawaii. We had one in Madrid, Spain. We had one in the Canary Islands at Tenerife. One of them was a ship named the Van Vanguard off the coast of South America and uh, we had I think we had two in, in Australia and probably a couple that, I, that I'm not remembering but uh, but you know you uh, when you if you if you went directly over a ground station you, you had the longest possible communication with that one if you were off the side somewhere it cut down on your communication. So we call it AOS when we could communicate. That's acquisition of sense of signal. Mm -hmm. And we were LOS when we lost mm -hmm. the signal. signal. Yeah. And so when we got ready to pitch it over 50 degrees, uh, the, uh, you know, the GN and C guys were the ones to implement that. And the fellow named Bill Chubb was in charge of that. Mm -hmm. So we were coming over our first ground station. He said, George, he said, we can get the command in, but we can't verify it. Do you want to send a command? I said, no. I want those temperatures down bad, but I could see, you see, when they send a command up, uh, and then they'd get command back down, they'd verify that that's what they really sent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they'd, they'd implement it. But if they sent a command up, and it was the wrong command, the next ground station you went over, that thing could be tumbling and you'd never get control of it again. So I felt like the temperatures were less of a problem than the chance of losing control of the Skylab. So, so and, and Dr. Patron was right there behind you on all of that. Well, he was still at the cave, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, virtually. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, he was. And uh, so anyhow, we pitched it over and and, and temperatures came down and you know it was still hot and then we put out the parasol and, and they did the first I don't remember what was the first uh, we, we had three missions the first one was supposed to be 30 days the second one 30 days and, uh, and, the, and the third one 56 days and uh, so I think uh, the parasol they put out uh, the materials people said uh, the solar radiation would would, would uh, degrade it and that we need something else out. Well, so we had a big showdown at the Cape, I believe it was, and uh, I presented the, the twin pole thing. And a fellow named Don Arabian from Houston presented to put out a bigger and better parasol. And anyhow, they... They ruled in favor of the twin pole, and we, so we put out that twin pole, but the people that were worried about it, they didn't know whether the astronauts out there, you know, those long poles could, could really control things. With parasol, you, you didn't have any really astronaut participation, and uh, they put that, they put that twin pole shield out there, and and Dr. Patron was on the phone then. He said, what are our temperatures? And uh, 
them, and they started coming on. Some of them that were off scale started coming back on scale. So once we got that full uh, two pole uh, shield out there, the temperatures then came down to what we had designed the thing for. Uh, one other thing I, that I thought was, was interesting, uh, you uh, you know, twin. Uh, Redundant systems are great uh, to an extent. If you have a generic problem, it affects both of them. So our thermal control, which control the the, uh, the, the EVA space suits, the, the Dash Nos War when they went outside the station, the electronic equipment, all that kind of stuff, uh, and the thermal control system, you know really controlled all temperatures and uh, uh, so the first time they went out on EVA a valve in our thermal control system stuck and uh, and we had to go to the other system a redundant system and uh, it it worked but you could tell there was something wrong with it what I think what it was it was contamination it was in the fluid in these valves that had close working tolerance, as you know, yeah. would hang up. And uh, you can, you know, you, you always try to clean the system. You flush it and all that kind of stuff. But if you're in zero G, and, and if you got, if during the flushing you had some stagnant regions that didn't really get flushed, then that stuff that gets collected there gets in. We think that's what's happened, but so this uh, this second uh, loop uh, was just right on the borderline. It was uh, the thing that we absolutely couldn't let temperature go below 32 degrees because the heat exchanger to the EVA suits was water on the crew side, and that water ran through tubes and you know uh, a, uh, what they call a. Uh, cool garment suit. Liquid cool garment, as I remember. Uh, a, a liquid cool garment. Is that's that. it. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so anyhow, we were we were running at about about 34 degrees, you know, just above uh, the freezing temperature. And we were on a night shift, and and uh, the people at Houston wanted to start playing with the system and see if they could get it done stuff. And, and uh, I told George Hardy, they, they better not mess with that system. It could get worse. And so we ended up calling Gene Kranz, who was a, a, a flight director down there. And uh, anyhow, Gene didn't see fit to reverse his people down there that wanted to do some, uh, some troubleshooting. So they... Uh, they started playing with the control, and sure enough, they st it, it went lower and it stuck. And we we're at about between 30 and 31 degrees, and it was just a matter of time till the mission was going to be over, because once that water heat exchanger froze up and and burst, and burst the, the mission was over. So, so we we really had to do some quick thinking about what to do. So from Martin is the one that came up with the idea. Uh, we were always facing the sun. We had these big 600-gallon water tanks up on the top of the, where the astronauts were. And the ones that were always looking at the sun ran very hot. So this, uh, this fellow said, why don't we take a liquid cool garment and tape it with duct tape to that hot bottle? And then turn the switch on, and that'll put enough heat into the system that maybe we can get above 32 degrees. So it was almost a, thought of as almost a sin to wake up the crew after they'd gone to bed. Yeah. But we woke them up and uh, told them to take that, that garment up there. That temperature got up, you know, like 33 degrees. And, uh, uh, I don't know of any case that, that uh, you know that equals that one as far as uh, ingenuity and uh, and and kind of uh, 
uh, turning uh, defeat into victory. Well, those were great days, and that's why I wanted to, 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 to do that. And you may remember, you know, I had the, the, the Skylab shower that was in there. Yeah. And, and I, my thought was is that, you know, boy, they're going to really like that shower since it, it's hot around there. And uh, some did and some didn't. Yeah. Right. Uh, but those were the days that uh, uh, somewhat uh, Bronco Patron, in my vision, was somewhat to the like of, of uh, General uh, Patton there. <laughs> you know, uh, he, he, he was one going to do something uh, 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 there, and, and if you were on his side, that was a good side. Yeah. And if you weren't on his side, there was there was no in between. No. Right. That shower you brought up kind of reminds me of something a little bit funny. Um, the uh, it was a great shower, and you know, we did a lot of work on it. And one of the one of the things we had to do is find the right temperature for the water. And uh, it turns out that if you want to take a shower. And 40 people all try the temperature. They're all going to agree that 105 degrees Fahrenheit is it's not exactly the right temperature. It's within a degree or two. So we found that out, and uh, we had to have soap that wouldn't foam because we had a water vapor separator that couldn't handle the foam. So we we picked Neutrogena, right. which was but the. Uh, the uh, the shower was a deployable thing. It was like an accordion. When you weren't using it, it was a ring, right. and then you pulled it up and, and took a shower. The first one was built out of hula hoops. Is that right? Right. And uh, the but the astronauts after they took a shower, they had to use their little vacuum cleaner and clean all the water off before they put it back down. And, and they didn't like to do that, so they didn't take too many showers. You know, you mentioned the soap, Neutrogena. We searched diligently to have one that would not foam. And that was the only thing, and it was the, the, the prime thing in dog soap. Is that right? Right. And that he got the name of dog soap from him. Is that right? right. Well, because the uh, shower was, took all that cleanup and everything, the, the crew didn't use it too much. And, uh, so they probably got a little raunchy mm -hmm. up there. And, uh, at the end of the first mission, uh, uh, the, the, the ground, they had a teleprinter on there that you send messages up at night. And when they woke up, they, they knew what their plan was for the day. And they sent a message up and said, said we've, uh, we've got good news for you. Uh, you. You get to change your underwear. And he said, Jack, you give yours to Owen, Owen, you give yours to Joe, and you know, yeah, that's right. The exchange. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, George, one of the things that I think in this recording that we'd like to touch on uh, certainly is, is the, the, the for the people that are doing the next uh, exploration to Mars that they're, that they're going to, uh, they should know some of the things that you went through relative to making success out of it. And uh, in many cases, it was pulling success out of uh, failure. And uh, uh, I think that's one of the interesting things. And we didn't have any computers to speak of at that time. Remember those uh, Marshall calculators? Absolutely, and slide rules. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you, you had to, to think of it. And, uh, after Finally, when computers did come along, uh, we were so suspicious of them that we really made sure that, that, the, that any pro program that was there was verified by a test uh, to, to essentially quantify the, the results of, of, the, of the programs. Uh, I guess that would be one thing. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well. Uh the, uh, we're starting off the this is a new lunar program. We're starting it off really from a uh, from with far less experience than we had the first. And what one thing I mean there, you know, the Germans had been firing rockets for ten years at the bridge. That's right. And, uh, and, and you know they too. And so 
All these Germans came over here, uh, at least the ones that we captured came over here, and they were uh, during the you know Apollo type program. They were before then. They were with the army, and then they was they were building that Pershing missile, 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 and, uh, and there was a lot of Americans that were working with them and learning. And uh, and then when they formed NASA, they brought all those guys over. Not just the Germans, but the people that have been working with the Germans. We don't have any experience base like that anymore. Uh, if you take a person who has, uh, has worked at Marshall Space Flight Center for 35 years. As you have. Yeah, he, he's only worked on the shuttle, you know, and his unique problems in going to the moon. Now, these are bright guys, and they probably got better education. Education, I think, improves with time, and uh, so. Uh, but 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 they are starting from a, a much uh, leaner uh, experience base. Than what we have. Well, they apparently, uh, at least from what my knowledge of my friends like uh, uh, that, that we work with and yourself too, they they still keep uh, 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 retired people somewhat. Uh, available for uh, uh, exchanges out there. I don't know how well that is working out there, but uh, the, there's there's the technology issue and then there's the, the management approach. Uh, and, and, and the old thing that uh, we will not have a failure. Failure is not acceptable. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, that, that philosophy is, is, is essentially going to have to be reflected in the future. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, they, uh, I think it's a helpful thing that they have these called consultants that are ex-NASA guys. Of course, a lot of the guys are dead. They're gone. They're still sick. And they're dying every day, too. Yeah. They, and uh, there's some good ones uh, left. And, and a lot of those people are trying to help. Uh, and, and, and they are helping. Now, uh, it's human nature to, you know, to think that you know better than, than the advice that you're getting from somebody else. That, that's built into us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, you know, that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, but, uh, well, at least they're starting with some experience that we had, you know, on, uh, on our mind. Uh, the, uh, there's some things that... Uh, are important in going to the moon that you don't run into with with, with the shuttle. You know, one of them is Pogo. Dust, and, yeah, and uh, combustion. Well, combustion instability. Uh, you got to deal with that no matter what what engines you're flying. Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess one of the things that I learned. Of the German rocket scientists was their uh, push towards testing everything. Yes. Uh, there was nothing that flew without much testing on the ground. That's right. Not simulation, but testing. Yes. That's one of the most difficult things to to get across to some of the uh, younger people. Uh, you you know, like when you develop an engine. Or anything else, you go through this really detailed certification program. You know, you run all the different power levels, and you, know, you accumulate enough time and all that kind of stuff. Well, one thing that I'm kind of fanatic on is 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 not made. once you get a, a, a system certified, you do not change anything unless sometimes you run into safety problem. You have to change something, but you ought to do all the testing over again, you know. But uh, I find that, that that a lot of the people, you know, nobody ever, whether it's a space program or anywhere else, nobody ever makes a change if they don't think it's an improvement. Mm -hmm. The uh, the problem is that that change will have side effects 
that you're unaware of. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some of the side effects you can, you know, you know, you can say, well, if we do this, that'll happen, you know. But you can't think of everything, and uh, so I, I. I No, no, it just came off. changes. I try to avoid them at all costs. George, why do you think we're here today? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, the, you know, when, when you're in the middle of a program, well, we had something happen not too long ago. They put a, they added a heater underneath the foam mm -hmm. on the external tank. Well, the heater had to have wires, so it went there was a a, a, a a duct or a pipe that had the wires in it, and it it went into the inner stage of the of the, the external tank, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that really bothered me. It bothered me a lot. Now I wasn't smart enough to know what you know changes might you know what side effects might be. The ones that I was was thinking of didn't happen, but. They, uh, the inner tank is uh, purged with nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So this nitrogen migrated uh, migrated up up into this uh, uh, conduit. Mm -hmm. So here you had a gas, a nitrogen gas, and it, and, and it was in close proximity to the, the hydrogen tank. Mm -hmm. Well, when they loaded hydrogen, the nitrogen froze, mm -hmm. right. and so you had the frozen nitrogen up in that up in that area, and then when you lift it off and you got aerodynamic heating, mm -hmm. then that nitrogen was turned into you know a vapor, it vaporized, and uh, and it blew, blew off a piece of foam. You know, well, who would have ever, you know. You'd, you'd have to be crazy to almost dream up a scenario like that, you know. So the answer is, don't try to dream up scenarios. Just don't do it. You know? Well, if you remember on the Saturn, the second stage that I worked a lot on, uh, it had helium that was blowing into the insulation of the, ex of the hydrogen tank. And uh, as we lifted off at the... At the very end of it, we we would decided, hey, how are we going? Once with that uh, that helium is at 14.7 psi on the ground. Now, when we it's fine, there's no pressure on it. But once we get up in the uh, uh, as the outside air gets a lower pressure, you've got a differential in that. Yeah. And if you remember, we had to put at the last minute some uh, bathtub plugs that pull popped out. You know, to to, yeah. to to be able to relieve that pressure yeah. on the first three that had the uh, that type of insulation before we went to the uh, the foam on the thing. Uh -huh. But uh, that was one of the uh, the I, I I really think the 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 German approach to to the things and what you're talking about. Uh, you don't have to spend money. For, for all these things, but you certainly have to have what you'd call a, a physical test of a lot of things yeah. uh, there. Uh, one of the things that we try to do as we, as we close these interviews is, is what we're doing now, uh, but trying to, to leave, ask, ask you to leave some your, your thoughts for the, for the future uh, uh, in the, the, where NASA's going, uh, uh, apparently back to the moon and to the Mars. Uh, uh, the, 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 there's, there's the engineering part and then there's the philosophy part of it. And uh, uh, what, do you, what, what, what do you want to, the people in the future to, to maybe consider? Uh, 
Well, of course, without funding, you can't do anything. So, you know, the administration, uh, the different, there'll be several changes in the administration, and, you know, hopefully they'll continue to fund the space program. Uh, other than that, you know, you, uh, yeah, you got you, you know you got to have good engineering, and uh, I think the most important thing is what you pointed out about about testing. Mm -hmm. You uh, you know you, analysis is great; it points you in the right direction, mm -hmm. but you have to verify. Ah, right there, yeah. quantify it. Quantify it. That's right. right. So I think uh, you know I think they got bright young men. Uh, and women too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But many more women now than we had yeah. uh, in the techno technology area. Absolutely. So, yeah, you know, I think they got all the ingredients if they get funded and and if our management is good. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we'll be successful. All right. Uh, any last thoughts that you'd like to, to leave? No, I don't think so, Bob. I think I said too you much already. All right. Okay. I guess that uh, ends it, Tommy.